Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, for any of you who don't know, my name is Lorene Shields. I'm the current director of the School of Public Health and Social Policy, and welcome to the first culminating conference. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, this morning by recognizing um, the territory on which the University of Victoria rests, so the territory of the Coast and Strait Salish people. And I just want to acknowledge that territory as we're visitors to this territory, I'm a visitor to the territory, and, and I have to say, particularly on a beautiful spring morning, just to recognize the lands that we're on and how, how um, wonderful they are. Um, and that we get this space and place to be able to um, pursue our learning is just so amazing to me. Um, I want to welcome all of you this morning. I have to say that as the week grew on this week, I got excited. <laughs> um, I re recognized that this was our first culminating conference, and it's just always so nice to see people's faces in the room um, and sort of get to, get to connect with you again. So I think there's a variety of people in the room, and I just want to acknowledge some of those people. Um, so first off, um, how many of you are from the 2011 MPH cohort? Okay, so, so the majority, which is fitting because many of you are doing presentations today. And then how many, are there some here from the 2012 MPH cohort? So welcome. This is, in some ways, what the 2011 students never got a chance of because they were the first. So it's so great to have you come and see sort of where you're headed and what the possibilities are. And it's that kind of um, mentorship between classes of students that I think is just so amazing to have and important to have in our school. Uh, and then are there any students here from, the, from our undergrad, from our BA program? One. <laughs> well, you're very welcome to be here. We've invited our BA students because we actually want you to be able to see where the, where the school is going, where our graduate programs go, and actually in nec the next round, we actually will also have BA students who have completed not a project but a paper and a practicum, and so they'll also be able to participate in the conference next year, and so that's another uh, exciting piece. Um, we have, of course, our, um, our staff here, so uh, Doug up the back, and Joan, and where are you, Carmel? <laughs> right in front of me. <laughs> Not far from me, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, with my five-minute sign, I see. <laughs> Um, so, and the faculty, um, oh, and I miss Betty, I miss Betty, our practicum coordinator, so, and faculty from the school, do you want to just sort of, <laughs> for anybody, and including an adjunct faculty member, so um, welcome Carol, it, it's always great to have a, others. We also are hoping that through the day we may get um, someone who's done practicum supervision with us and so that would be um, another great um, opportunity. I'm going to, just before we sort of launch in, I, I want to um, tell you a couple of detail pieces. One is that there is a uh, change uh, in the name of the location for the um, reception this afternoon. So it's actually, um, I think uh, Carmel tells me it was Veggie Greens and it's actually called Village Greens, but it's in the same place. We just got the name <laughs> wrong. <laughs> And it's over in uh, Cadborough Commons, and I think we've been in Cadborough Commons before with you, but there's maps all over. I have a couple of maps. Carmel's got maps on the doors. So if you're trying to figure out how to get there, just we will say a little bit more at the end, and also there's lots of maps around that will, will help you on your way. Uh, the other piece is that we are videotaping. And so uh, Carmel has consent forms for that. And uh, if you didn't get one, we're going to pass them around. If you have any concerns about being videotaped, please um, come and let one of us know, Carmel or myself, or the person who's videotaping up at the back, so that we can um, um, just 
make sure that, that you're not in any situation that would make you uncomfortable. And I just want to say thank you to our videotaper as well. I really appreciate it. This is one of the ways that we can start to share with future students the kind of work that you're doing. So um, today, more than anything, now that I've sort of um, talked about some of those details, today is a day that we get to sit and listen and hear about your practicum and projects. And I find having taught at, on, been on campus for 20 years this year, which is, just feels unbelievable, I feel like this is always the culmination in some ways of a, of a well done master's program. And you have been, there's 18 of you who have been engaged in a 450 hour practicum. That's a huge commitment. And we recognize that it's a huge commitment. It's part of the accreditation guidelines for MPH programs. And so it's, we see it as just an integral part of the program. And then you've also simultaneously, um, so you've been engaged in that with Victoria and Victoria's guidance and then simultaneously working on projects with Kathy. Um, lots of times when graduate students come to the end of their project and they need to defend it <laughs> or present it, there's a certain amount of anxiety or nervousness about, oh, <laughs> this is sort of it, because really the, the guidelines that we use in the Faculty of Graduate Studies require you not only to produce a document, but also to do a presentation about that, be able to speak about it. In professional schools, I think that that's just it's just so fitting and given because we actually need to be out there talking about the work that we do and be able to present well and present to our colleagues and leaders in the field. So what I, I guess I just want to say to you is I am truly looking forward to hearing you today. Think about this as really your opportunity to have colleagues sit and listen to the kind of work you've done and reflect on it. That's what it's about. It's not about sort of a, a bar that you need to jump over so much as a, let's, let's give you the time that you need to be able to present, have us listen, and reflect and ask you thoughtful questions. So, Mostly, I hope you enjoy today. Um, even if you are nervous presenting, I hope you just it, can settle in and enjoy it. We are absolutely looking forward to hearing um, the work that you've been doing and, and, uh, and being able to engage in those conversations. And in many ways, hopefully this is one, if not your first opportunity to be able to um, present at a, in a professional context and have your, your work um, heard. So without further ado, I am going to pass the mic over to Michael Hayes and he will introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you, Lorene. There's no anxiety in this room, is there? I can't imagine. <laughs> I'm also tempted to give you the worst Michael Buble ever, but I won't. <laughs> anyway, it, it is actually, uh, it, this is a great day for us uh, for all the reasons that Lorene explained. Um, it just, you think about all the energy that's gone into creating this program and all of the uh, aspirations associated with it and to see you now here uh, sort of poised to present the work you're doing is really uh, fantastic. Um, it's also fantastic uh, for me to welcome Melanie Rush. Uh, Melanie is the manager, I, I, I better actually not wing this because I'll get her title wrong, uh, the manager of population health and epidemiology with the planning and community engagement team at Vancouver Island Health Authority. Um, Melanie is uh, uh, originally from British Columbia, Osoyoos, I believe, if memory serves. Uh, she did her uh, MPH at Johns Hopkins in the Bloomberg School there, uh, and her PhD in epidemiology at UBC. Uh, she has, uh, the focus of her dissertation was on women's sexual health, particularly uh, those in, uh, involved with um, drug addiction um, and uh, issues of HIV. Um, she then uh, became uh, 
assistant professor at uh, um, University of California, San Diego. How am I doing? <laughs> I feel like the amazing Kreskin or something, you know? Um, and, uh, and then most recently in January, uh, came to our community to work in public health. And so we thought it would be most fitting to welcome not only people who are emerging as professionals in public health, uh, but also a recent recruit uh, to a really important position within the local structures of public health to reflect on her experiences uh, and sort of share uh, some thoughts with you about the challenges and opportunities that exist in the realm of public health. Melanie. So I'm going to try and switch over here. Okay, is that, can people hear me okay? Is that good for sound? Great. All right, well, um, first of all, thank you for that introduction, and uh, thanks for inviting me here this morning. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm honored to be part of this inaugural culminating conference event with the School of Social Policy and Public Health, um, and I'm excited to hear about some of your own research over the next few days. Um, I think it is really a, a great time to be in the health field right now, um, and uh, whether you're in research or in health services. Um, and I'll speak a little bit more to that later on, but what I thought I'd start out with today is uh, just a little bit of background um, and some stories about my own experiences. Uh, and I'll finish off with some thoughts on what I think are the challenges and opportunities um, that are making this such an exciting time to be uh, in the health field. So um, I titled this talk, The Changing Face of Public Health. Um, so when I was asked to join you this morning, uh, the suggestion was to speak to some of the uh, upcoming challenges in health. I was trying to think of something catchy to title it, um, and I couldn't really come up with much, but I thought of this. Um, and my first thought was that this has probably been used somewhere before. Um, so uh, sure enough, I Googled it, and <laughs> the title came up. Um, so uh, the first thing that, I, that came up was a paper from the 60s um, that was uh, around the uh, decline of infectious diseases and the, the um, emerging importance of chronic diseases in society, in Western society. Um, there were also some papers in uh, the late 80s around shifts in uh, public health nursing structures, um, as well as some more recent papers around global warming and health and um, public policy and health. Um, now, as an infectious disease epidemi epidemiologist, I'm sure you'll probably guess which, which one of those tangents I'll go off on. Um, now, also, as a, a, any good academic knows, you can't have a title without um, colons. So, um, <laughs> this is where I tried to tie in a bit of a theme for the talk this morning. Um, so, in my own career, I've moved from microbiology all the way over to strategic planning, which is where I'm sitting now. Hence, from bugs to the big picture. Um, so uh, as for how this relates to some of the shifts in, in public health, uh, well, well, hopefully we'll get there. So, okay, so back to this decline of infectious diseases. I'm sure you've probably all seen this graph before. Uh, this is the mortality of infectious diseases in the U.S. over the 20th century. So you have this steady decline, mainly attributable to uh, uh, better hygiene um, and uh, better urban infrastructures. Antibiotics, of course, not available until uh, somewhere around the 40s. Um, it's already declining before then. And then we've got the big spike of the uh, Spanish flu in 1918. Anyone know where the Spanish flu actually started? Well, the U.S. probably, yep. It's actually Haskell County, Kansas. Um, so there's a local doc, Lori Minor, who started to notice cases in the community, um, uh, some odd trends in mortality of the flu in that, seat that year uh, with uh, lots of uh, more mor higher mortality and higher mortality in younger folks. Um, and he did, uh, he did bring this to attention of, of the authorities, the public health authorities at the time, but the U.S. was mobilizing for war, uh, so no one really wanted to, uh, to think about the, the fact that there might be this other serious epidemic to consider. Um, and so army camps all over full of, full of young men moving back and forth, and one of these big army camps was quite near Haskell County. Uh, and sure enough, a few months later, probably about two-thirds of the largest army camps in the U.S. had flu epidemics going through them. But again, it was kind of kept under wraps. There was no quarantines going on yet. 
And part of the reason was, um, of course, the, the, the war and the, the politics that come into play. Um, so there were things at the time like the Espionage Act, so you know, spy on your neighbor kind of stuff, and um, the Sedition Act. And this one is interesting. The Sedition Act was uh, an act that made it illegal to utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the government of the United States. Um, so, you know, you, wouldn't, you didn't want to start, you know, spreading rumors that maybe the, the troops weren't quite up to snuff because they were sick with the flu. Um, so it was kept under wraps, soldiers were sent over to France, and uh, in France a similar sequence of events occurred, and, and no one really talked about uh, the fact that the troops were, were hit with the flu. Um, and eventually, later that spring, the flu hit Spain, and at this time, probably because the king became ill, became more publicized and uh, became known as the Spanish flu. Um, so now in this case, it's an example of how um, politics and, and um, social, uh, social unrest can influence infectious diseases by you know, trying to keep, keep things under wraps, but it can also go in the other direction. Um, and as we know, army camps uh, weren't just full of the flu, they also had things like measles, and of course, um, STIs. So, um, <laughs> STIs were actually a pretty serious issue in terms of sick days and soldiers being uh, on bed rest um, at the time. And so the approach uh, was to run a media campaign, which of course had to be carefully crafted so as not to be moral, morally shaming towards the soldiers. Um, so instead, women, of course, carried the brunt of the stigma. Now, uh, at the t in, around World War I, um, at, in New York for sure, and probably other places as well, um, women, a woman couldn't go into a bar by herself. Or she could, but she'd run the risk of getting arrested for solicitation. Um, so just some of the impacts of, of some of these uh, directions with media. Um, not that we've come that far. I don't know if anyone else read, there was a recently an article in the Huffington Post written by a, a young woman from Canada traveling to and through the US who had uh, talked about the several occasions having been taken to secondary and questioned about the condoms she was carrying in her suitcase. So uh, back to the decline of infectious disease. Um, so by the 1960s and 70s, things were looking pretty good. Um, so much so that the U.S. Surgeon General, Dr. Uh, William H. Stewart, reportedly stated that the, with available interventions, we'd be closing the book on infectious diseases. Um, that's actually contested whether or not he actually said that. Uh, a lot of people can't find the original, uh, the original um, publication or, or quote. And uh, he himself, um, before he passed, said he never remembered saying that. But. Um, <laughs> Now, and he, he is actually a pretty impressive person. He was, he was with the group uh, that pushed to have the first warning, uh, warning placed on cigarette packs. Um, he was an early proponent of preventive medicine um, promotion of, and health promotion. And he was talking about environmental health and um, things like air pollution and noise pollution before these were really on anyone's radar. But even if he had said it, um, it, there was definitely a lot of people that, that thought that and there was good reason for it, right? We had just, we had eradicated smallpox we had a polio vaccine, we had anti-TB drugs, these were all like some of the biggest killers at the time, and we were, we were making good strides on them. Um, and a quick aside on smallpox, because I think this is another sort of important point. Um, there was definitely biological reasons why we were able to eradicate smallpox, right? It, oops, lost that. So, so there's bi biological reasons, right? It's, uh, it's only in a human reservoir. Um, so it makes it, it's, there's no animal reservoirs, there's no environmental reservoirs. So we can uh, take care of it that way. Uh, now that's true for STIs as well, but we're nowhere near eradicating any of those. Just other reasons for that. Um, also, it has high pathogenicity and virulence. So there's not really a lot of people walking around uh, without symptoms, so it's easy to, easy to catch cases. Um, but maybe one of the more important things um, was that there was really strong political will. Uh, so smallpox was recognized not just by health professionals, but by countries and governments as something that we needed to take care of. And so that mobil mobilization and support was something that really allowed that initiative to succeed. But clearly we did not have the handle on infectious diseases that we thought. 
Um, so this is a slide from a class I used to teach in emerging infectious diseases, um, outlining sort of both new, inf new emerging infectious diseases. So these are uh, ones often attributed to zoonotic events, um, a, or, a, and as well as re-emerging diseases that are potentially due to development of drug resistance, for example, or appearance of a disease in a new geographic region. And I know it's taking me a while to get here, but I do have a point. Um, <laughs> So what I, what I really loved about uh, teaching this class was that, you know, we did um, learn about microbiology and epidemiology of, of a lot of these infections, but we spent a lot of time discussing the ultimate causes of disease emergence. So this was things ranging from environmental causes, whether, um, you know, man-made, climate change, uh, natural disasters, to demographic changes, um, so things like travel and social cultural changes. changes. We have population size, migration, urbanization, um, overcrowding. We have an aging population. We have growing immunosuppressed individuals making them more susceptible to infectious disease. We have changing social behaviors like group child care and group elder care that um, bring people together and allow uh, more transmission. Globalization in general, increased travel and trade. Sociopolitical disruption. I was just like the story I was telling you about infectious uh, influenza and, and the war. Um, as well as technology. So this can be anything from health technology um, to technology of how we produce and consume and distribute food and water. Um, so here's where I'll draw some parallels for how, th how I think things are changing a little bit in public health and more generally. So there's sort of, a, I think, a movement away from looking at really specific diseases and specific causes or even multiple causes to a much broader conceptual conceptualization of health um, and disease in society. And so my own career path um, uh, has taken me a bit on a similar journey. So from microbiology all the way through epidemiology to, um, to public health planning. Um, and I have a caveat here, and that's if you have questions about what it means to be a health planner, you can hold on to those uh, for next year when I've been in the job for more than two months. <laughs> Um, so I actually started right here at UVic. Uh, I did my, um, my undergrad degree in the microbiology department. Um, so I was interested in basic sciences. I had a, a special interest in infectious disease. Um, I took advantage of the cooperative education program, and I spent several work terms at various labs uh, all over Canada doing everything from squishing ticks to um, identifying proteins using mass spectrometry. Um, and so my microscope wasn't quite as fancy as the one that took this picture, um, but I, I did spend four months looking at tick specimens um, through a microscope looking for these guys, this Borrelia burgdorferi. So that's probably 16 weeks at uh, 600 hours, maybe round down to 500, um, five slides an hour. So I probably looked at 2,500 slides, and I found one possible spirochete. <laughs> so I completed my degree and decided that lab sciences weren't really for me. <laughs> um, so my next stop was Baltimore. Um, I didn't have any good photos on hand, so um, I was there when the Ravens won the Super Bowl the last time, so I thought I'd put that up. I was also there when Bush was first elected president, but that was less exciting. Um, <laughs> when I started at Hopkins, uh, I was still really interested in infectious diseases. Uh, my plan was to go into global health. I wanted to look at malaria or some other tropical disease. Um, but at some point, I started to get an interest in sexually transmitted infections. Uh, and I was introduced to Dr. Stephanie Strathy, who, for those of you who don't um, know her, she's a fellow Canadian and she's a leading HIV researcher. Um, she's had a fairly strong influence on my career since that point in time. Um, at that time, she was the PI of the ALIVE study, uh, and that was a longitudinal cohort of persons who inject drugs. And I ended up doing my master's thesis with her. Um, but instead of focusing on disease transmission, what I ended up looking at was um, sexual behaviors. And the idea was that we had this cohort that had been followed for many, many years. They'd been coming in regularly for um, HIV testing and counseling and, and survey visits. Um, and so what we wanted to see was if, uh, every, when they came in and they did their HIV testing and counseling, because they were known to, to inject drugs, a lot of times the focus on the, on the risk counseling was on their injection behaviors. And we wanted to look to see if there had been any changes in sexual risk behaviors among those who were sexually active. Um, and what we found was that there wasn't. So uh, this was where I, my interest started to peak in terms of thinking about 
not just overlapping risks, but really the broader context of people's lives and things like the risk environment. Um, so the micro and macro, social, physical, uh, political and economic factors that can work together to create environments that produce risk. <clears throat> So after my master's, um, I decided, not un un entirely influenced by the uh, election results, that it was time to come home to Canada. Um, so Dr. Strassi, who had pre previously worked in Vancouver at the BC Center for Excellence on HIV, uh, encouraged me to apply at UBC and gave me some contacts. Um, and I found myself in the PhD program, uh, which was then the uh, Community Health and Epidemiology program. I wasn't in the School of, of Public Health and Population Health yet. Um, one thing I really appreciated about my time at UBC was the exposure it gave me to a much broader array of, of topics. Um, I was introduced to things like qualitative research, community-based participatory research, and I think there was really a, a much more central focus on things like the social determinants of health. Um, and it wasn't that these concepts were unfamiliar, um, but during my master's everything was very focused on, on your specific stream. I was in infectious disease epidemiology, very quantitative. Um, and, it, and there wasn't much cross-pollination. Um, now, there's a time element to this as well. I think sort of this, there's been a general move over the past decade to increasing interdisciplinary work and, and really uh, a lot more uh, cross-pollination of, of uh, in, in, re, in health research. Um, but in any case, I started work on a thesis project uh, in the downtown east side out of a community health clinic, working with a women's night program there. Um, and what I looked, I still kept a little bit of a focus on infectious diseases, um, looking at sexually transmitted infections among a group of women. Um, but I also uh, looked a little bit more broadly at things like the social and structural barriers to access and utilization of sexual health services. Um, so not just STI testing, but um, the less stigmatized sexual health services like pap smears as well. And as part of my, um, my thesis work, we developed a preliminary scale where we tried to incorporate ideas of both stigma, shame, as well as um, a female-specific societal moral piece uh, attached to STI stigma. So my next stop was, uh, once again, thanks to Dr. Strasti, um, the Division of Global Public Health at UC San Diego. So I spent a few years there as a postdoc, and then uh, moved up to an assistant professor position uh, up until just earlier this year. So as a postdoc, you, uh, you generally write, write grants for funding for specific training goals. And um, I had had a little bit of an introduction to um, geographic information systems, so GIS uh, and health during my PhD work on various projects. Um, and I knew that Dr. Brower, uh, Kimberly Brower, a colleague uh, down at the Division of Global Public Health, was doing work on HIV and GIS research. And so I knew there were some opportunities there. Um, and I also had some interest in things like social networks. Um, and I ended up focusing a lot more on spatial epidemiology, but I did, ha did have some exposure to, to a lot of different um, uh, new methodologies while I was there. In addition to working on a lot of large cohort studies and, and training in, in GIS, um, I was able to conduct a small study of my own. Um, so Proyecto Amantes de la Salud, Lovers of Health. Um, this was the name that came from the preliminary focus groups with the, with the female sex workers, the women from um, Tijuana that we did the project with. Um, it was a small pilot intervention to assess a peer-driven outreach uh, testing model to women working outside of the main red light district, um, venue-based women. And uh, in addition to looking at a little bit at the geographic um, uh, spaces, so where these women worked and how far, how far of a distance they traveled to and from work, um, how far they were from health service centers and, and where we placed the outreach uh, testing centers as well. We also um, wanted to look at the idea of uh, bringing in peer networks, and this was adapted from a model called Pasa La Vaz um, that was used, uh, had been previously piloted in the border region of El Paso. Um, and the idea here is essentially to bring in some, uh, some women peers and, and do a training session with them, giving them information both on sexual health, um, general knowledge, as well as uh, service knowledge, um, and specifically some information about the outreach that we were going to be doing as well, and um, asking them to go out, pass the word, pass the lavaz, uh, as well as pass out coupons for the, for the event and to see how, how much that could impact who we brought into the, um, to the outreach event. 
Um, so it turned out we compared this between a site where we just did sort of standard outreach methods, put up posters and that sort of thing, and it turned out there wasn't a lot of difference in who showed up for testing, but that was mainly because it was mostly clients and passerby's testing. Um, but there were some differences about how the women, how many of the women and, and how they heard about the project, um, and also how they interacted with the, with the um, outreach staff while we were there. So it didn't, there was some impact of the, the peer model. Um, and so that brings me to today. Um, once again, I found myself sort of needing a bit of a change and ready to come home to Canada. Um, and serendipitously, I came across a position for a population health um, epidemiologist, and there was some mention of GIS in the job description, so I thought it sounded like a pretty good fit. Uh, and I found myself here in Victoria working for Vancouver Island Health Authority. So officially, my position is manager of population health and epidemiology, and I'm with the planning and community engagement team. So what I, I tend to work on a lot of projects with the public health folks, the medical health officers, um, and do a lot of work with large administrative databases, so census and uh, vital statistics, hospital data sets. Um, but, I'm, but I'm also in that planning world, and so this means that I participate in some of the strategic planning for the organization, and um, the, the idea that, I can, that I'm to bring the population health lens to that planning process. So if you've ever had a talk by um, uh, someone from VIHA, you've probably seen this slide. Uh, VIHA serves about 17% of the population of the, of the province, around three quarters of a million people. Um, we employ about 18,000 healthcare professionals, have about 1,700 physician partners, 150 facilities, about 1,500 acute care beds, $1.8 million or billion dollar budget, and one strategic plan. So I, I thought I'd share this with you as well. Um, so there was a recent revision of the organization's vision and values, um, and there was a, a process for this, including a lot of engagement with uh, staff in various departments across VIHA, across the island. Um, this was all done before I arrived, but the planning and community engagement team that I work with was, was quite heavily involved in this process. And so the new vision is um, excellent care for everyone, everywhere, every time, with a set of values that, uh, with the acronym CARE. So courage, aspire, respect, and empathy. <clears throat> all right, so at the beginning of this talk I said that things were changing. But what's really changing? What are the new challenges we're facing as health practitioners or health researchers? Um, well, to be honest, I'm probably not going to tell you anything new and exciting. I think these are probably all things you've heard before, and they're things that have been happening um, in one way or another over the past decade, or sometimes even much longer. Um, but I think what, what is changing is there's a, a bit of a groundswell and uh, a bit of a convergence happening across these themes that's creating a bit of a space for opportunity. Um, so demographics, I'm sure you've probably seen these before. These are uh, the, the general categories of, of uh, population growth and demographic shifts. <clears throat> so you have the first transition from, uh, from rapid growth to moderate and slow growth. Um, and that's usually linked to things like better health, decreased mortality, uh, and sort of shift in quality versus quantity of children. Um, the second transition from slow growth uh, from moderate growth to slow growth and, and eventually decline is linked to increasing age of marriage, decreased fertility, sometimes also to increased fertility at, at older ages for, for, uh, as well. Um, so aside from, from this declining um, population, the other th uh, population decline, the other thing to consider, oops, where are we here? Yes. Um, the other thing to consider is um, the aging population. So this is a graph uh, with the, uh, the, the population pyramid um, for Canada. It shows 1999 versus 2009. And you can see that we are in that decline period. Um, so that was the, the last point. Now here's um, the graph from VIHA looking at population projections. Uh, and it's split up by the age groups. So you have the under 19 group on the bottom there as well as the uh, 65 and older group, the green line. Um, and the red line being the bulk of the population, 20 to 64. But if you hone in on 2010 to, t to 2020 there, you can see that while, while both the under 19 and the 20 to 64 groups are 
remaining fairly steady and maybe even declining a bit, um, that over 65 group is, is steadily increasing. Um, now this isn't a VHA specific problem, but we do have a, a high concentration of retirement communities, um, and we have additional in migration of retirees that, that adds to our numbers as well. And this is important because um, as we age, we tend to use more health services, uh, and the cost to the system is, is uh, significant. So the other thing to consider here, though, is that as the population ages, so does our workforce. So we have a bulge of baby boomers coming up that population pyramid, and we have less and less young folks coming up to take their place. Um, so as far as healthcare goes, you know, we're, we're going to have to we have there's an increase and increase in, in people that are going to need healthcare services, and there's less and less people to deliver those services. So the next thing we have is, is globalization. And this, is, this isn't just the interconnectedness of the population and the movement of people and ideas, as well as infectious diseases, um, but it's also a growing globalization of, of the concept of health. So this is somewhat linked to technology as well, but with the rapid advances in information technology um, and analytical approaches and, and methodologies that are used in the health field, I think there's, there's more and more interdisciplinary interdisciplinary work across fields like computer science, engineering, mathematics, geography. And from a policy perspective, the, the concept isn't a new one, but there's more and more movement towards this idea of health in all policies um, with integration of health perspectives across sectors. Um, I don't know if anybody was able to attend, but a few months ago, the U of Vic hosted a forum in conjunction with the Capital Regional District um, discussing their, their regional sustainability strategy for the, for the area and population health was a key area that was discussed. Okay, so next uh, is the environment. Climate change is, of course, uh, you know, uh, on everybody's mind, and it's important to recognize that climate change isn't just a, a, a problem for conservationists and catastrophists. It's got very real, immediate impacts for public health, so including things from heat stress, food security, drought, water shortages, um, so there, there's really important things to consider here. And if anybody does happen to be a conservationist, I re recommend this, this book, um, which recently came out. Uh, it contains articles and essays by scientists and policy analysts um, tackling the question of sustainability. Um, and in line with this, there's also discussion around things like the built environment. So this is a term that's also become very popular in, in the health field. Um, and again, here's an example of this convergence of ideas. Uh, we can talk about uh, the built environment in terms of, um, with respect to sustainability, but we can also talk about it uh, in terms of accessible spaces for enhancing physical activity and combating the obesity epidemic, or about having safe spaces for sex workers to work uh, to lower the risks for violence and related harms. Um, so social determinants, now this is one of the, one, one of the ones that's been around for decades, many decades. Um, you know, in the 1970s, the United Nations and the World Health Organization came out with a report on disparities in life expectancies uh, across social gradients. Uh, it's around the same time as the Lalonde report that was released here in Canada that formalized the distinction of health promotion from, from medical care um, and that really recognized some of the physical and social environment um, factors that were important in health outcomes. Uh, and then in 1986, we had the Ottawa Charter, which highlighted the importance of health healthy public policy and supportive environments in health and health promotion. But so here we are in 2013 and we, we know all these things, we know how important the social determinants are, um, uh, and yet we still see gradients in life uh, in life expectancy. Um, we see disparities regionally in Canada. We see disparities um, by income gradients. Um, and we know that these are linked to health outcomes as well. But what I think um, has been slowly changing is sort of more the, the ability to apply the evidence into practice. Um, you know, there's been years and years of research and evidence building, um, and I think there's really a move to be able to put um, social, de social determinant-based um, interventions and, and um, uh, prevention efforts into practice. And it's not to say that this, there hasn't been uh, successful attempts in the past, but I think there's sort of a growing push for this right now. Okay. And finally, we have um, technology. So I spoke a bit about the growing integration across disciplines 
in GIS, mathematics, modeling, network theory, and system science. Um, and, but there's also this idea of, access, the, of information technology, accessibility and availability of data, new data collection tools. Um, I had some colleagues down in San Diego doing work, um, social network research, and really integrating this with qualitative research. So they, uh, there's new tools being developed where you can sit down with somebody um, and have a visual on the computer to really map out their social network while you're recording a conversation about what those social connections mean to that person. And you can see how they change, as they talk, where they're putting people and where they're moving people as, as they t um, start to realize where people should fit in their social networks. So some really interesting things happening there with the merging of technology and, and methods. Um, as, as well as technology in application of health services. Another um, a colleague of mine was doing work on using uh, cell phones um, for directly observed therapy for TB. Um, so for hard to reach clients, they were able to timestamp and send in a video of themselves taking um, their medication rather than having to make an appointment somewhere because they were homeless or, or moved around a lot. Um, and so also, also things in, the, in more of the biomedical fields, genomics and biomedical informatics. Um, I spoke earlier about emerging infectious diseases. I don't know if anything, anyone's familiar with Dr. Nathan Wolf's work, but he's a leader uh, in the field who's done fascinating research using viral genomics um, and trying to get a jump on the next big zoonoses, uh, essentially studying what he terms viral chatter. So just looking at genomic sequences that are um, um, coming out of samples that they're taking from from primates in humans in regions where there's lots of interaction, and looking for sequences that might be viable in humans. So with all these areas sort of merging together and problems getting more and more complex, um, I'm seeing and hearing people talk more about things like system science. Um, so this is about moving beyond looking at one specific aspect of a problem and really acknowledging the interconnections that exist across multiple dimensions. Um, this is an example from a consulting firm in the US, Shift N. Um, they're a system, system science group that um, applies their approach pretty much to any topic you can throw at them. Um, and I'm sure you probably can't read all that, but, <laughs> um, but this is basically a system science look at uh, factors impacting obesity. So it's pretty complicated and it's not that I'm uh, advocating for everyone to go out and learn system science. Um, but I think that what this is happening across different levels, uh, at different levels across different fields. Um, so, for example, in infectious disease research, um, people started, to, about 10 years ago, people started talking about the idea of not epidemics, but syndemics. So this idea that you can't just talk about HIV because it's, 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 in extra, it's in, entwined with um, HCV and TB as well, and you have to really consider all of those infections together. Um, and it's the same thing with recognizing the, the idea of social determinants of health. It's, it's, in essence, a way of thinking back about the broader system. Okay, so um, let's come back to a bit of a local context. So in terms of health challenges here on the island, um, again, uh, we do still, I already talked a little bit about the aging population, and we do still have a, a burden of chronic disease. Um, in addition, we uh, continue to struggle with mental health and substance use, um, and we have uh, very real health disparities uh, across our regions, across socially marginalized groups on the island, and among our Aboriginal communities as well. So as a health system, um, we, we also deal with, um, with some structural challenges. So things like delivery of, of services in rural and remote communities is, is a real challenge, um, and the aging workforce, which I spoke about earlier. Um, so the integration of health services uh, is something that is changing. It's, 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 we're in transition. Um, but the challenge here, along with the social determinants, I think is really being able to apply these in, in a way, in a, in a very real way. So these are some of the, the main themes from um, our strategic plan that was created for 2008 to 2013. We're sort of currently in the, in the uh, planning phases for the next uh, strategic plan. Um, and the, but this isn't a static document. It's updated uh, over time as well. So you can see health promotion does come into play here. Um, improved health and wellness prevention and promotion efforts. Um, we have integration of health networks. Uh, both for quality of care <clears throat> as well as client-centered care. 
and there's an, uh, an emphasis on, it, on having a sustainable health system. <laughs> and so that's maybe the one thing I haven't mentioned yet, is this idea of, of sustainability, specifically with respect to the cost of the healthcare system. So this is also going to be a challenge. Again, nothing really new here. Money always uh, seems to be an issue. Um, but I think combined with some of the other challenges that we're facing right now, um, an aging population, the um, uh, rising burden of, of chronic disease, um, the fiscal pressures are, are really going to force us to have to innovate and to focus on bigger system issues. <clears throat> and so these challenges, along with, I think, this increased infiltration of, of really m more broader systems thinking, um, whether in health promotion, <clears throat> in, in applying uh, social determinants of health focus, um, whether in integrating across, in the way we work inter, uh, with interdisciplinary work and integrating um, health service delivery, or whether you're in a health policy uh, framework and you're talking about integrating across health across uh, sectors. I think all these things are really creating an environment that's going to be conducive for some, some really necessary innovation um, and hopefully for some effective change. And so that's, that's it. Think big. <laughs> Melanie, thank you so much. I think we do have some time for questions, so I'm going to pretend that I'm Phil Donahue and walk around with this and let you ask questions so that they can be picked up on the video. Um, so, studio audience, anyone? Questions? Come on. I work with the greatest people. Um, thank you for the great presentation. I, um, I work at VHA, so I think uh, that intrigues some interest of mine. Um, do you see a problem there? I don't know if that's the right word, word to say here, but with having such a massive sort of a structure as VHA with one strategic plan, I mean, with the different cons contacts, different area, different population that is serving. Yeah, you know, I think that is one of the biggest challenges, and it's a struggle is to um, for an organiza organization that not only is such a large organization but has so many different types of health services uh, and serves such a very different population. You know, we're we're one of the only health. I've, all, all the health authorities have similar issues, but I feel like we really um, span all of the issues uh, here in Viha. We have, you know, northern rural and remote communities. We have an urban area. So, no, it's definitely a challenge. And I think, you know, I think as an organization, it, it, we, you still need to have an, an overarching strategic uh, plan. Um, and I think the challenge is, is instead of saying there's too much going on and, and having everybody sort of do their own thing, it's, it's really that integration that needs to happen um, and bringing the services together and not having them so siloed as they've been in the past. I think that's sort of where people are trying to go, but it, it's, it's, it's difficult and it's going to need some, some creative solutions. Uh, thank you very much for our very engaging uh, presentation, and I'm happy to finally learn why it was called the Spanish flu. Um, I wanted to ask you, what, what are your thoughts about the H7N9 uh, influenza, and are we ready and prepared? Are we ready and prepared? Well, <laughs> will we ever be ready and prepared for the next pandemic? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> H7N9, I think, um, so far, uh, doesn't look like it's being able to make the jump to being able to spread human to human, so I don't think that's necessarily going to be a concern. And, and we're on, and it, again, because some of the lessons we've learned in the recent past, I think we're, mu we're much better now at monitoring that and, and being able to catch that early if it does start to make that transition and be able to spread human to human. I also want to thank you for your um, presentation, and it's lovely to meet somebody else who's bounced around so much in her career. So uh, thank you. 
Um, I wanted to ask about um, the, the role of community engagement in a strategic plan. To what extent have communities been involved in developing a strategic plan and which communities? Right, so um, this, is, this is new for me. This, these are the questions you were supposed to wait for next year to ask. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> So I mean, community engagement, uh, so our group, uh, um, planning and community engagement can, means a lot of different things. And so depending on the project, you know, community engagement can mean engagement with, with physicians. It can mean engagement with, with BHA staff. It can mean actual engagement with a community. Um, so it, it can mean different things. And um, I, I, I believe that as we're starting this uh, strategic plan that there will be a process of engagement across all those areas. Um, to what level that's going to be, I, I'm not really sure. I, I don't really know what that will look like yet. But, but I do believe there will be some form of engagement with community-based organizations, municipal governments, communities themselves. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm just curious, was your role newly created, or and and if you could give a bit of background on the on the department you work in? Um, sure, <laughs> it, it's sort of newly created. Uh, it, it the population health epi position existed before I came, um, but it used to be housed with public health, um, sort of a, a surveillance uh, position more so, um, and it was only recently. Uh, before I came that the position got transferred. But w there was no one in the position. It was vacant for a few years, but it got transferred um, into the, the planning side of the structure. So, so it's very new in that sense, and, and we're sort of building it as we go. One last opportunity. Behind you. Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and hopefully this will spark a couple of others. I'm going to shift gears a little bit, Melanie, and sure. ask you about um, the personal piece, um, and it's bouncing off of Lynn's question. I think in public health we're lucky because we can bop between um, academia and policy and services and back again because that's the nature of what we do. Um, so for the students, both the 2011 cohort and the 2012 cohort, um, I'm wondering if you have any advice about the ways of approaching career development. Oh gosh, as someone I know, it's a big question. So it's a big question and I, and I sort of just did whatever came most easily. <laughs> oh, come on. I saw, I saw many values and many lines of inquiry that were built into that maybe path of least resistance. So what were some of the key things that you used to help make your decisions? Um, I think definitely uh, the mentorship was, was, a, was a big one for me. So, you know, um, Dr. Shrathi from my master's forward has always uh, been sort of a model for me to follow, aspire to, although you know, I could never reach the level that she's at. <laughs> but um, de so definitely mentorship and really just connecting with colleagues. Um, I've always been a bit of a dabbler as well. And so just throughout my career, I've always almost been more interested in what ev everyone else is doing and sort of trying to uh, get a, a finger in everybody else's work, um, which I think is, is also, it's useful because you get exposed to more things. You, you might find your passion in one of those things. Um, and, it's, and it's those connections that will, will help you find out how to move into a different direction as well. So I think um, the, those would be my main, my main two thoughts. This lightning stick is available. Thanks uh, and welcome. Thank you. Um, one of the more interesting pieces for me in that final slide was a specific reference to healthy workforce. Um, it's probably not as widely known as it needs to be that the health care uh, setting is one of the most unhealthy places to work in the country these days. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested in whether your mandate in population health is going to extend to the population of the workforce of VR and what they intend to do about it to create healthier workplaces. Right. Now that last one may be a little bit beyond your, your <laughs> knowledge in the first well. two months. <laughs> uh, that's what I, th I thought it might be. 
That's a, that's a great excuse. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> um, no, that's a, that's a great question and it's a good point. And it, it, it was part of the, the last strategic plan and, and I think it's even probably going to be more strongly a part of the next uh, plan as we move forward. Um, because it, it, like you said, it is a very serious um, problem and we, we need to maintain a healthy workforce um, if we want to meet the demands of the health that the health care system is going to have. Um, how we do that now I think the nice thing about me being both in the planning and the population health side is that I'm attuned to that now and so uh, that is something that I can make a part of population health as I move forward whereas if I hadn't really been on the planning side it might not have occurred to me so um, so I think that is something that we can work into into the work we do afraid I actually do look like Phil Donahue. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Much younger, much younger. <laughs> um, just wondering with regards to uh, the strategic planning, I guess it's important that there's sort of cross-government efforts for health promotion. I'm just wondering, is the strategic plan contemplating working with other bodies such as uh, transportation or health or um, school boards? Right. Um, again, I, I don't know to the extent that it, it will be because I haven't been part of this process yet, but I know that there are plans to engage with municipal health authorities and, and, and hopefully some of those other um, bodies as well. Um, I do know that there is a growing, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of work actually recently with um, some members of the, the CRD. Uh, there's a specific health, um, health and wellness um, committee that's working on the regional sustainability strategy and, and sort of uh, has uh, some efforts in, in many areas. So I've been working a little bit with them and so I, I, I see that as links that will build towards being able to, to really integrate across sectors, so. Sorry, I talked too fast. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie, for your presentation. Um, part of what I most enjoyed was sort of the, the walk through from the microbiology all the way to this sort of really broad perspective. And I think that um, both we've seen public health as a field evolve in those directions, but obviously it's also been an evolution for you in your, in your learning. Um, I'm wondering if you would just comment a little bit on Given that, like given that you know that microbiology piece, <laughs> as much as you know now the, the broader perspective, social determinants, all of those kinds of things, how, when you think, think now about some of the issues that you see in the community, particularly I'm thinking about your interest in women and, and injection drug use and, and um, HIV, how do you think about that? Like how do you reconcile all of all those pieces, where do you start and how do you bring some of that together in your own, in your own mind and in your own work? Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think I more often than not, I, I start from the bigger picture these days. <laughs> it's really hard, once you sort of move up that, that ladder of, of, of thinking, I think it gets harder and harder to, to pull back when you, when you start to see an issue unfold, you really, step back right away and think, okay, well, what, why is that happening? What, what are the social influences? What, are, what is the physical environment like? What are the um, big picture pieces um, that are causing this, this situation where these behaviors are occurring? Um, and so I think building that puzzle and, and working through back down to the smaller pieces is, is the way I think about it, um, rather than sort of moving up from, up from the disease itself. I really appreciate the breadth that you showed us because I think that's so much a part of the field. Yes, Thanks. Definitely. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, and so maybe with that, I'm going to bring this to a close. Okay, great, uh, thank I, you. Melanie, I just wanted to say um, um, thank you so much uh, for a really um, very, I think, helpful, thoughtful, reflective um, overview of you know, your journey through uh, public health. This is a small token of appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. And
And, and before we break, I just want to actually underscore uh, another part of uh, this um, opportunities that are happening within VHA. And that is that um, VHA has been working for a while on a strategic research plan that would actually engage partnerships. You know, it's a, a funny thing that the health authorities and the universities tend to be separate universes. Um, and there are lots of different reasons for that. There are issues of timelines, there are issues of, you know, what the purpose of the work is and so forth. But there are also obstacles that relate to ethics approval and who can look at data and all those other sorts of things that really relate to institutional risk management in a certain sense. I think that we're really on the verge of a new day in which some of those barriers are actually going to be broken down and where we're going to be looking, in fact, probably mandated uh, to think about the ways in which the resources at the university with respect to research and uh, analytical capacity can actually merge with and work with uh, people in the health authorities around some of the real world practical problems that are being faced. And of course, the aim of both institutions are to enrich the human spirit. Um, and so I actually welcome the opportunity, not only that you come to our community and working in this very important area, but at a time in which there's a mandate for us to have conversation, to be engaged, and to think about the ways in which we can collectively deploy our resources to achieve better health outcomes, less grief, less suffering, and you know, much more ability to thrive, not just survive. So we'll take a break. You have your programs, I think. We're back here, I think, for 10.30. And oh, there's coffee outside. Um, right? And, and fruit and cookies and I think a parade. Oh. <laughs>